<laughs> the Mubakirin, mashallah, here filling up the crowd early. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, bless your morning, bless your evening, bless this weekend, and make this a weekend, inshallah, of, re of renewal for all of us. Allahumma ameen. There's a verse in the Quran that we, we take great pride in as an ummah and that we've all heard before. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ Allah says, you, O Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, are the best nation to be brought forth for mankind. And then Allah goes and lists three reasons why that verse applies to us. He says that you enjoin the good, you forbid the evil. And you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the three key qualities that make us the best nation to be brought from mankind. And this is what we find in divine scripture. But if we look at the state of Muslims today, whether it be here locally in America or it be internationally across the world, we don't think when we see Muslims or Muslim communities or Muslim nations, when we see the state, we don't think this is the best nation. Those thoughts are reserved for others, but not our own selves. We look in Muslim lands and we see poverty. We see oppression, we see corruption. We look in non-Muslim lands and we see Muslims aren't a people of influence or power and also are being targeted. And so the thought comes up that Muslims actually aren't the best nation, right? And this narrative begins to develop about us that whether you look in in Somalia, or you look in Yemen, or you look in Saudi Arabia, or you look in China, or you look in, in Europe, wherever it is, what's the common denominator between people that have different tongues and different colors and different clothes and different foods? The one thing that unites them all is their faith. So the narrative that begins to develop is that the problem is actually in their faith. Islam is a backwards religion. Have you heard that before? Islam is a regressive religion. Islam is a religion for past times. We've all heard these things before on our TVs and our radios. And perhaps what begins to happen is we internalize these same thoughts that have become common discourse in society. Now why is that so dangerous? Because Malcolm X, rahimahullah, he spoke about this, that when you begin to hate yourself, when you begin to look down at your own features and your own qualities and your own attributes, then you're a doomed nation. But here's what's interesting, is the statement of Allah is true and eternal to the end of time. You are the best nation brought forth from mankind. Because of these qualities, you enjoin good, you forbid evil, and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another verse, and I want to examine this thought and kind of dissect it down in the brief time that I have today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says something very interesting that again, if we pause and look at our, our situation today, it'll make us question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah An-Nur verse 55, He says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ 
ولا يبدلنهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا يعبدونني لا يشركون بي شيئا ومن كفر بعد ذلك فأولئك هم الفاسقون. Allah subhanahu wa taala says something very interesting. He says Allah has promised, He has guaranteed that for those who believe amongst you and do righteous deeds, what will be the results? He says He will most definitely establish you in the land just like He did to those before you. And He will secure you in your religion that He has been pleased to choose for you. And He will replace after your fear peace and tranquility. He says these people worship Allah and they, have no, they, they associate no partners with Him. And whoever disbelieves after that is from the wrongdoers. So it's a cause and effect relationship that Allah is describing in this verse. Allah says that their iman and good deeds your iman and your good deeds is the cause what is the effect that you will be given authority in the land that you will be given security in your religion and practicing your religion freely it's a direct cause and effect relationship the cause is islam and here's I'm going to take a step here, but you need to work with me. The cause is Islam, and the result, the effect, is advancement for society. Where do I get that statement from? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the sunnah of Allah. That you can't have a nation that's living in the stone ages and still be given power in the land in this day and age. It's impossible. You can't see a backwards person, yet still as a nation being given power and authority and security. Right? So Allah SWT is equating something here. But what happened is we've lost our tradition. We've lost our tradition. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala He says in another verse, in Surah Al-Qasas verse 77, He says, وَابْتَغِ فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ and what Allah has given you in this world, use it to establish, to seek your home in the hereafter. But then Allah says, Allah says, but don't forget your portion of this world. So Allah has given you all of us something of this dunya. But then He says what? Use that to establish your home in the hereafter, but don't you forget taking care of what you need to take care of in this world. But what does that mean? First it means, that you do have a portion of this world. That you and I have a portion of this world, but then we're being taught the idea of what? We use it to try and invest in our home in the hereafter by doing good in this world. See, Islam doesn't have this idea, this ideology, this final revelation to mankind. Allah did not include in it this idea of monasticism, that we leave society, that we just live in the masajid, and we have no impact on the community around us, that we go to mountains or faraway lands and just cut ourselves off. That's not from the philosophy of a believer. You know, in a very interesting, authentic narration, the Sahaba, Ka'b ibn Uzr anhu, he narrates that, he says, a man passed by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, This man, he was earning a living for his family. But in doing so, the Sahaba saw that he was energetic, he was strong, and he was very skilled at what he was doing. But he's earning a living for his family. And they said, لو كان هذا في سبيل الله. If only this, this energy and this strength and this skill was used in the path of Allah. It was only used in the path of Allah. Have you ever seen someone that you, and you thought, man, this guy has so much talent. This sister has so much talent. If she just put it in the service of the masjid or the service of the religion or the service of the Islamic organizations, how much good would come from you? Right? So they're saying this person has so much talent. And you know what the Messenger of Allah said in response? 
He says, "In kana kharaja yasa ala waladihi sigaran, fahuwa fi sabil Allah." If this man came out, he's earning his living, but he's doing so with the intention of supporting his children, then he is actually in the path of Allah. And he says, وَإِنْ كَانَ خَرَجَ يَسْعَى عَلَىٰ أَبَوَيْنِ شَيْخَيْنِ كَبِيرَيْنِ فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And if he comes out earning a living to support his two elderly parents, he is also in the path of Allah. وَإِنْ كَانَ خَرَجَ يَسْعَى يَعِفُّ نَفْسَى فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And if he came out, if for no other reason but just to make himself self-sufficient, so he's not on the street. He doesn't have family, he doesn't have kids, but just to support himself, then he is also in the path of Allah. What does in the path of Allah mean? When the Messenger of Allah is saying he is in the path of Allah, what does that mean, brothers and sisters? It means, Ay laka ajr. You're being rewarded for that. Every moment of earning a living if your intention is pure, is actually ibadah to Allah. It's actually worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why do people work? Why do you and I work? It's either to support our families or support ourselves. That's why people work. And the Messenger of Allah is teaching us something here, that in your work, it is worship for the sake of Allah, meaning you are being rewarded for every moment. So you have a brother who's a mechanic, and he's sitting under the car, and it's cold outside, and his hands are cold, he's feeling the pains in his fingers, and he's struggling to get a rusted bolt off the bottom of the car. Every moment of that, every second of that action, is actually ibadah is actually ibadah. Now why is this, what does this have to do with Islam being backwards or not being backwards in Islam's advancement for society? Well, you have to understand a few things. Number one, we have to understand th this concept of ibadah. Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah, he, he defines ibadah for us. He says, al-ibadah ismun jami'ah. This concept of worship in Islam, it's a very comprehensive idea. He says, what it encompasses لِكُلِّ مَا يُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَيَرْضَاهُ مِنَ الْأَقْوَالِ وَالْأَفْعَالِ الظَّاهِرَ وَالْبَاطِنَ It includes everything that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from both speech and action, both hidden and open. So let's say on the way, you're leaving the session now, going to your next session, and you stop by the bazaar, and you see a beautiful hijab that you want to buy for your daughter, or for your mother, or you see a beautiful toy you want to buy for your son, and you take it to the hotel, and you pack it ready, and tonight when they come back from their sessions, you give them this gift. And you see the smile light up on your daughter's face as she gets this toy. And she gives you a big hug, and she says, Baba, I love you. Thank you so much. I've always wanted this. Every second of that, from the moment you were walking in the bazaar and looking for the item, and the moment you purchased it, and the moment you went to the hotel and you wrapped it up, and the moment you gave it to her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for every second of that is giving you reward. What a beautiful religion. Somebody says, I don't want this dunya. I want akhirah only. I want jannah only. Islam tells you, if you want jannah, your vehicle for that Jannah is this world. And you get rewarded for every moment as long as you have the right intention. So that's the first thing we have to understand. Number two, we have to understand a, a guiding philosophy and principle in the life of a Muslim. And that is what that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for all of us. That we have a responsibility. طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم to seek knowledge is incumbent upon every believer, every Muslim. You and I have a lifelong journey to seek knowledge. When I was in Egypt studying Arabic, my neighbor across the hall from me in the apartment complex was 83 years old. And when he came to Egypt, he didn't even know the Arabic letters. 83 and he came to study Arabic. It's a lifelong journey. But what happens as you increase your knowledge? You advance in society. You learn new things. You, know, you learn things about agriculture, about chemistry, about biology, about engineering, about astrology and geology and, and all of these fields. Allah, the first revelation was what? Iqra, 
Bismi Rabbi Kalladi Khalaq. Recite in the name of your Lord who has created. The scholars say this command for reciting and learning and reading is about the knowledge of the religion. Because Allah coupled the iqra' bismi rabbik in the name of your Lord. But then a few verses later, in the same first revelation to all of mankind, the final revelation, Allah says, iqra' wa rabbuka al-akramu alladhi allama bil qalam. Read, recite, learn. And your Lord is most generous, الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ The one who taught with the pen. And what does the pen write, brothers and sisters? The pen writes the knowledge of men. And so the scholars say this command is for learning and expanding our knowledge in all fields of this world. All political science and, and agriculture and engineering and medicine. We as Muslims are commanded to seek knowledge in these fields just as much as we are about the religion. The religion, you and I aren't asked to be scholars. Allah never asked us to be scholars. But He does require of us to know the basics of our religion so we can practice appropriately. The second, the third idea that you have to understand before we bring it all together is that in anything that you do, if you're an engineer, you're a teacher, you're a you're, 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 you're a plumber, you're a mechanic, you're a physician, you're a lawyer. Whatever it is in your field, Allah wants something from you and what? And that is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, كَتَبَ الْإِحْسَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah has asked you and I that in anything that we do, we do it with excellence. Now you can't be an excellent doctor unless if you're a master of your, your specialty. You can't be an excellent teacher unless if you are a master of the, 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 the topic that you are teaching. You can't be an excellent farmer unless if you are, an, you are a master in agriculture. And so Allah wants you in every field that you pursue, don't just stop at the basics. Allah wants you to excel, to research, to test, to, to experiment until you come and expand your knowledge and you become a master of that in whatever field it is that you're doing. The Messenger of Allah went on to say, even in something so simple as slaughtering an animal to, so you can eat, he says, if you're going to do it, then make sure you sharpen the blade and you don't cause any harm to the animal. That's the mercy of Allah, but that's also the philosophy of the believer. So now we understand Number one, that Islam asks Muslims. We understand that if we worship, we, we earn a living, we are actually getting rewarded by Allah. And we understand that we have to be masters in our field and that we have to continuously seek knowledge. And by necessity, when you do that, society advances. By necessity, by you, brothers and sisters, living the life of a Muslim. Living the life Allah asks you to live by the principles Allah has outlined in the beautiful religion He has given to mankind, you will by necessity advance society. Now, someone might say, Brother, you're going too much. You're going too far. Let me share with you a very interesting hadith. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in Abu Dawood Nasa, authentic hadith, he says, Ya'jabu rabbuk min ra'i ghanamin. Allah is impressed, is delighted by a shepherd. Fi ra'si shadiyyatin lil jabal. He is in the head of a mountain, on top of a mountain with his flock. He's grazing his sheep. And what happens? The time for dhuhr comes in. The alarm goes off. It's salah time. And so what does he do? He says, So he stops watching the sheep and he makes adhan and then he prays his salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, Look, oh angels, look at my slave. He makes the call to prayer and he prays, he fears me. And then what does he say? قَدْ غَفَرْتُ لِعَبْدِي وَأَدْخَلْتُهُ الْجَنَّةِ I have forgiven my slave and I have admitted him into paradise. Allahu Akbar. But let me ask you a question. 
Is there something strange about someone taking time off from work to pray? On Friday, yesterday, when you left work and went to Jum'ah, or at Asr time when you took a couple minutes and you went to the side and you prayed, is there anything strange about that? Let me ask you a step further. Who has it more difficult? The shepherd in the field who doesn't have anybody around him in the mountain? Nobody to look at him, nobody to catch him with his foot in the sink at work, nobody to criticize him. He doesn't maybe have a boss who hates Muslims. He's not under that pressure. Who has it more difficult, you when you leave your work for prayer or the shepherd when he prays? I think the argument can be made that you have it more difficult. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this shepherd for praying while doing his job in this world, while earning his living. He's forgiven him all his, all his sins and granted him paradise. So what would be the reward for you? What would be the reward for you? So you see, Allah wants you to take care of your dunya affairs. But in doing so, you don't sacrifice what he has required of you of your, uh, from your religion. Right? So, brothers and sisters, Islam is unlike any other society or any other philosophy in that it merges both deen and dunya in a way that nobody else has. Right? And so when you look in our history, what do we see? We see in... In, in Muslim society, when Islam, when religion, when religious teachings were flourishing, so were the secular sciences as well. We were the top in medicine. The first hospital in the world in Damascus was built 700 years before the first in Italy. Qurtuba, Muslim Spain, and we say West versus East, but Spain is part of Europe, but it was a Muslim land. Had 50 hospitals before the first was built in what we refer to as Europe. So the Muslims were excellent in, in the secular sciences and the religious sciences. That's what Islam asks of us. Whereas we see in the dark ages, when we were in the, when mankind and the part of the world was in the dark ages when did the dark ages get re relieved or removed after the reformation and what happened in the reformation when they pushed religion aside and the renaissance took place but they weren't coupled together but Allah has given us a beautiful religion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says and I'll end with this he says in one of the final verses revealed to mankind he says al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Allah says, today, I have perfected your religion for you and completed my favor upon you and I am pleased to have for you Islam as your religion. Brothers and sisters, hold your heads high. You are a blessed people to be from the nation of Muhammad Wasallam, And you have so much from our religion to take, to offer to society. Brother Naeem just spoke about how much society is hurting. Islam has given us the solutions. We have to learn and apply. May Allah give us tawfiq wa aqoolu qawli hadha wa jazakum al khayra wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.